I had the privilege last night of letting somebody into the church. A couple of guys came to the church last night, and they spent the night in here. I have spent the night in here a few times. It's exciting, thrilling. But they came last night. His name's Keith, and he came in to spend the night last night because yesterday was, um, I think it was like a homeless awareness day. And so what he was doing is he was coming in to raise awareness, and he, he did a little Facebook live stream. And so he is advocating with city leadership for increased shelters and, and a different response to the homeless situation that we see plaguing our city. And so he's, he's trying to advocate for that and gain support for that. And what impresses me about him is that uh, he's a businessman who could have paid, who could be paying less attention to that issue. Successful, wouldn't need to engage in that problem at all, except that he sees this need in his city, and it weighs on him so much that he's decided to act upon it and to make an attempt to do something and to use his connections and his, what a lot of people would call privilege, to do something, to make an impact and to make a difference in his city. And so I thought, well, that's a pretty cool thing, a pretty cool story, a pretty, it's, you should, I, I'll try to find the Facebook video and send it to you, but that just impressed me. And it really impressed me as I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today in Nehemiah. We're going to start a new series, and we're going to spend some time walking our way through the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is a man who saw a problem in his city. Well, actually, it wasn't even the city he was living in, but he saw a problem with his people, and he too chose to, to get involved and to act. He didn't have to. Like Keith, he could have stayed disengaged and not really worried about it because it didn't really impact him directly. But Nehemiah decides to get involved. Now, what's interesting, what's intriguing to me about Nehemiah, Nehemiah has always impressed me, but I'll be honest with you, I've not spent a whole lot of time studying Nehemiah or reading through Nehemiah. How many of you had to look up the page, if you still use, you know, an old-fashioned Bible, had to look up the page number to even find Nehemiah? It's page 457 in my Bible, in case you were wondering. But it's not a book that we often read, and it's not a book we often talk about. I was even talking with Dan today about worship music for the next few Sundays as we talk about Nehemiah, and I was like, man, I don't know if we're going to be able to have a theme. You might just have to pick one. Because Nehemiah, there's just not a lot out there about Nehemiah. But Nehemiah is a cool story about a, a man who saw a need and decided to act. And I think the world needs more Nehemiahs, more people who see a need and decide to make a difference, and decide to act. So the book of Nehemiah, let me give you a little history. The book of Nehemiah takes place just after the return of Israel from the Babylonian exile. Now, they were in exile in Babylon for about 70 years. And so if you know anything about the history of the Israelites, you know that they had seasons of obedience, seasons of disobedience, and they would wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and they would spend 70 years in exile. The folks had some problems. They didn't always get it right. And so they're human, just like us. So this comes after a season of exile, and there's two books actually that go together in this story. And it's helpful if you read both books to get the full picture. It's Ezra, which comes before Nehemiah in the Bible. You have Ezra and Nehemiah, and they both go together. And so Ezra deals with the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. That's his specific part in this story. And as you read through the book of Ezra, you read about Ezra getting the people together to rebuild the temple, to reinstitute some of the temple practices and some of those things. And so that was a great celebration during those days. But what Nehemiah does now, Nehemiah comes along after Ezra rebuilds the temple. Nehemiah comes along and his main goal is to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Now both of these men... I'm not sure whether they really realized it or not. Both of them were attempting to do way more than just build a building or build a wall. 
That's what they were initially trying to do, but they were also in that effort trying to renew a lost people who for generations had failed or struggled at best in living in the reality that they were God's chosen people. And in their efforts to renew this building and this wall, they began to restore the calling of a people, to restore the identity of a people. There's a book called A Passion for Faithfulness written by J.I. Packer. He offers a really interesting perspective on the book of Nehemiah. And in that book, he talks about, he relates the book of Nehemiah and what Nehemiah was doing to our modern day church. And he talks about how if we really wanted to break this down, we could look at Nehemiah and we should read it as a testimony to the renewing and sanctifying work of God amongst his people today, amongst the church. And I thought that's an interesting way to read the book of, of Nehemiah. Because now it, now it hits close to home. Now it's not just some Old Testament book that we only read when we're reading through the Bible once a year and we skip past it really as fast as we can. But this isn't just a book that's about building a wall or building a temple. It's about renewing an identity in people. And there's some controversy around the book. There's a lot of people that think highly of Nehemiah. There's also quite a few people that don't think very highly of Nehemiah. Because they look at him as mean and as abrupt. And he wasn't the nicest guy around. And they, some would even question as to why he was even building such a wall when the prophet Zechariah prophesied that the city of Jerusalem would be with no walls and everyone would be welcome to come in to the city. And so it's, a, it's an interesting book that we can certainly relate to our, our place in the story, in God's story today, but it's not without its, its conflict. So We have a great book, an interesting book that we get to spend some time with. To me, Nehemiah, I look at him as a great pastor, fantastic pastor, who was called to go to a struggling church and attempted to get this church back on track. So when I read through Nehemiah, that's kind of what I'm, that's the lens through which I'm reading about him, that he's this pastor who lost his mind and went to a struggling church. And somehow was allowing God to use him to try to get it back on track, right? And these people were struggling. Their building was even in disrepair. And so were the people. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah is a a Hebrew who lives in Persia. And he was serving as the king's cupbearer. Now, it was a pretty elevated position when it came to to various positions that a servant would have. And it was a pretty important one because one of the main jobs of the king's cupbearer was to make sure the king wasn't being poisoned. So sometime before the king would eat, the cupbearer would make sure by eating or drinking what the king was about to eat or drink, he would eat or drink it, wait a while to see if he gets sick and and dies. And if he doesn't die, well, he's safe for the king to now eat the food. This is Nehemiah's job. But in that job, he had some, some, some privilege, and he, he had it pretty good, as long as he didn't mind, you know, three or four times a day risking his life for the king. So if you read through the book of Nehemiah, you'll see that Nehemiah was a tough man who was not very easily intimidated. And I would think that you would have to be that kind of person if you were going to serve faithfully as the king's cupbearer, dealing with that stress every day. So he was tough. He was determined. He wasn't intimidated. You couldn't turn him from something very easily. And as we'll see as we read throughout the book, he didn't put up with nonsense. He was just done with that and ready to move forward. He was focused and determined and believed fully in who God was, believed fully in the promises that God had given. And perhaps one of the most important things about Nehemiah is that he was a man of much prayer. In fact, I think there's 12 different occasions throughout the book of Nehemiah that we can find Nehemiah deep in prayer. So this book of Nehemiah, and we're going to start in chapter 1, picks up right after Ezra, right after the temple's been built, and right after this strange ending in the book of Ezra. So you would think Ezra would end on this high note of the temple has been rebuilt, God's people are returning from exile, and things are exciting and things are good. 
and, and that would be this, this high note. But Ezra actually ends on a little bit of a, of a low note. As their place of worship has come back and the place to offer sacrifices and commune with God has been built, now there's this conviction of sin that is happening. And Ezra quickly points out that the people have been disobedient and, and they have married people that God told them they weren't supposed to marry. And they needed to confess of this and set things straight. In the end of the book of Ezra, what we read about is that some people went along with that, confessed their sin, and began to live the way God wanted them to live, while others did not. You know what that sounds like to me? Division. Because that, how would we do, that would happen here in this church if some of us believed one thing and another group believed another. There would be division. We see that happening in our world and in our country all over the place because just like during the days of Ezra and Nehemiah today, we still haven't figured out how to agree to disagree. So these folks were living in some chaos and in some turmoil, even though their temple had been rebuilt. So it's with that kind of setting that we find ourselves in Nehemiah. And so let's start with Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 says, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah, and I can promise you I will not pronounce all of these names correctly. But these are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. Yes, that's what I said. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Han and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Here comes Nehemiah, this king's cupbearer, asking about people living in a city that he wasn't living in and how they were doing. And I want to ask you today, what stirs you? What breaks your heart? What would move you to weep and fast and pray for days? Keith is moved to do something about those on the street in our city. So he spends the entire night on his birthday in a church on Facebook Live trying to gain support in an effort to put people into various programs and shelters. Nehemiah, at this moment, sees a city that's struggling and is moved to tears and fasts and prays. So as we look at this today, I want, to really, I want you really to consider what is it that moves you? What is it that stirs you in the same way that Nehemiah has been stirred about the city of Jerusalem? He's bothered, isn't he? He's, he, can't, he can't sleep. He's mourning. He's fasting. This cupbearer who could live a decent life just can't sit back and do nothing. Just before this, we see Ezra in Ezra chapter 10 in a similar situation where he too has been greatly bothered or greatly broken over sin. He too is mourning. And in, in Ezra chapter 10, we see Ezra weeping and laying down before God. And in that instance, Ezra is broken over the sin that he sees in the people. And he begins to confess their sin. And now Nehemiah is also broken and weeping over the people in the, in the disgrace and the trouble that he sees them living in. Now, if I was to step back from all of this, and if I was to look at all of the situation that was going on, if I was to offer a critique of these returned exiles that were living in this city, I would have to say they aren't bothered. Ezra's bothered. Nehemiah's bothered. Maybe some of the people are bothered. 
but it doesn't look like as a whole they're bothered. It doesn't sound like they care a whole lot about the trouble or disgrace that they're living in. Otherwise, you wouldn't think you'd see them living in trouble or disgrace. They haven't rebuilt the wall. They haven't begun to fully live as God's chosen people. Some translations say they're living in shame. So these folks are living in this city in trouble and disgrace or living in shame. Ezra has encouraged them and helped them build the temple, which didn't really bring about a whole lot of unity because they still refused to accept God's word as a whole. They still refused to live as God's people. And they're continuing to just live in this brokenness, which to me is what this broken wall symbolizes. The wall is just, it's a wall. But what's really going on is this is a broken people who don't seem to be bothered by their own brokenness. Except for Ezra and except for Nehemiah. Everybody else just, they're living in trouble and disgrace. And sometimes I just wonder, which side of that story are we on? Are we bothered to the point where we're going to mourn and weep and pray for God to act, for something to change, for things to change, and whatever it is that we're bothered about? Or are we going to be like the people living in this brokenness and just, well, live in trouble and disgrace? Are we bothered and are we bothered enough? Nehemiah and Ezra are bothered to the point of doing something. The people don't seem to be bothered enough. So, man, sometimes I wonder if, if, if nothing stirs us, if nothing bothers us, if nothing takes us to our knees in mourning and weeping and praying, then is that a problem? Is that an issue? And maybe that should take us to our knees to mourn and to pray. But what bothers us? And are we even bothered by it? And we don't all have to be bothered by the same thing. We don't all have to be praying for the same thing. But maybe we should all be bothered by and praying for something. So Nehemiah is bothered. Nehemiah is bothered to the point of weeping and mourning and fasting and praying. And it's all based off of this information that he got by a simple question that he asked. Somebody shows up, one of his brothers comes to visit him, and he says, how are those people doing over there? Horrible. Horrible. And that right there just moves him. Now, I think Nehemiah wasn't just trying to start conversation. I, I think that he was asking because he was genuinely concerned for the people that live there. And he was genuinely seeking the information out. Now, it's hard for me to believe that this is the first time Nehemiah had heard that the people in Jerusalem were struggling. He's the cupbearer for the king. Surely he had heard conversation over meals at the king's table. Surely he had, he had heard something from someone. Like, I don't think this was the first time. So I think Nehemiah kind of already expected the answer that he got. He kind of knew where this was going. But he asked anyway. Even though he knew that the information he was going to get probably wasn't going to be the greatest information. But he asked because he cared. He asked because he needed to know. He wanted to know. And I love that Nehemiah asked the question even though he knew the answer might not be the one he wanted. He wasn't afraid of gaining that knowledge, of gaining that truth. I love knowing that he asked that. And I wonder if we were in the same situation, would we have even asked how often do we not ask the question about the things we care most about or consider the things we care most about because, well, what we don't know can't hurt us? Anybody ever said something like that? What I don't know can't hurt me. Honestly, it's, it's much easier sometimes in life for us to just not know, to live in the dark, it's easier to live that way because then we don't have to do anything with it. What you don't know can't hurt you. If I don't know what my kids are doing with their friends, I don't have to worry about disciplining them or getting them in trouble. 
If I don't know what my son is doing at the table in the back right now, I don't have to worry about. He's not even paying attention to me. (laughs) But you know what I'm saying. If we can ignore some truth, then we feel free from that burden. Because now I don't, have to, I don't have to do anything with it. If I don't know it, it's not my responsibility. If I don't have that truth, I don't have to do anything about it. There's a gentleman named Warren Wearsby who says, When we truly care about people, we want the facts, no matter how painful they may be. Closing our eyes and ears to the truth could be the first step toward tragedy for ourselves as well as for others. We can't. As followers of Christ, ignore the truth that's around us, even if that truth is hard to hear. We can't, as followers of Christ, claim to love our neighbor if we never ask them how they're doing. We can't, as followers of Christ, ignore the problems and the burdens that we see. We can't ignore the sin that's in our own life or the lives of those around us. We just can't do that, or we shouldn't do that. So I love this challenge that Nehemiah presents, that we better start asking the questions even if we're afraid of the answer. We better not be intimidated by that. We believe that we serve a God bigger than the troubles or the problems that we're facing. We believe that we serve a God who will equip us with every tool that we need to do the things that he's called us to do. Nehemiah wasn't afraid to ask the question. And then when he finally got the information, I don't think he knew what to do with it, which is why he went to the Lord with prayer. I've got to do something with it, but I don't know what. And so he goes to God and begins praying. And he says, this is, I don't know what else to do with this. Oftentimes, the very thing that bothers us that bothers us like this, that moves us to prayer, that moves us to tears, that keeps us up at night, those things that that stir us, I'm telling you, those are usually the areas God is asking you to serve in. God is not giving you that, that burden. God is not stirring in your heart for no reason. Follow Him in that. Warren Wiersbe goes on to say that oftentimes information brings obligation. Information brings obligation, and we don't always like obligation. So we avoid the information. But God has given us all a a place to serve. He's given us all an obligation. And as God is calling on us and and nudging us in a specific direction, let's lean into that instead of running away from that. So Nehemiah finds out this information, this very place that God has stirred him, and he's willing to allow God to to use him to serve in that capacity. But he doesn't know what he's going to do. And that could be the very reason we don't want the obligation, because I don't know the first thing about doing anything about it. So the things that stir you, is it Is it broken relationships that really burden you? Is it kids? Is it teens? Is it addicts? Is it messed up families? Is it the hungry, the sick, the thirsty, the hopeless, the friendless? What is it that stirs you? And don't be afraid of it just because you don't know what to do about it, because God does. So Nehemiah, he's stirred to the point of prayer. I want to read to you Nehemiah's prayer. Verses 5 through 11. Nehemiah says, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember that you told your servant Moses, if you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. 
The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. Now look at this prayer. Now we might think that this all happened pretty quickly, within a few days, right? But when you follow the timeline laid out in Nehemiah, Nehemiah was mourning and was praying for probably three to four months before he ever got an answer. This wasn't just a a one day he had a passion for it and the next day it was gone. This was something that bothered him and stirred him over and over and over again. And so he kept praying and he kept mourning and he kept fastening, fasting in agony for these people. And he clings to some things. And as we go through that prayer, there's three things that jump out at me at what Nehemiah is leaning on and who he believes God to be. And the first thing that I believe Nehemiah is, is asking or is admitting in this prayer is that, God, I know you see this too, and I know that it bothers you. I know that the people not living for you bother you. The things that bother us bother God. The sin that bothers us, it bothers God. The brokenness that we see that bothers us, it bothers Him. There's a really good chance that the things that stir us, the, un, the injustices, the, the anger, the hate, the, all of that that stirs us and bothers us, it bothers God too. And so don't ever think for one second that just because it bothers you, it doesn't bother Him because it does. And as Nehemiah goes to God in prayer with these things, then he is believing that these things have messed God up too, that this is not what God wants for his people. And that just as he is bothered, so is God. And so in in this prayer, in all of what Nehemiah is saying, that's what I'm I'm hearing this, this truth that Nehemiah believes, that God cares. Otherwise, why would Nehemiah take even a moment to pray to him if he didn't believe it? So the things that stir you, the things that bother you, know right now that God cares about them. And that God cares about you wherever you might find yourself, even if it's in exile. God cares. So Nehemiah takes time to pray to God for months over these people because he knows God cares about them. He knows the people are sinning. I love that Nehemiah took time to confess not just his his sin, but the sin of the people. And he says, I'm not perfect either. Even I and my family have sinned. You know what that tells me? He knows God to be a forgiving God. He knows God is going to be a God who forgives and restores. You yourself, Lord, have said that even if we were exiled to the ends of the earth, If we came back to you, we would be restored. He knew God to be a forgiving God, a God who was all about restoration. And so these things that he sees that are bothering him, he knows God cares, and he knows God wants to do something about it. Praise God for that. Do you know that God cares about the brokenness in our world? That God cares about the brokenness in your life? God cares about the hurt that you have experienced or are experiencing. And he cares enough that he actually wants to do something about it. He wants to give you relief. He wants to give you forgiveness. He wants to give you victory. He wants to give you freedom. This is the God we serve. He cares about you to the point of he wants to actually do something about it. Now, Nehemiah prays this prayer, and he doesn't just sit back and and brush the dirt off his hands and say, you know what, I've done my part, I prayed. Look at the end of Nehemiah's prayer. He says, okay, this is who I know you to be. And I know we need to be restored. I know we need to be forgiven. God, would you restore and forgive? But then look what he says. He says, grant me success today. By making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. What Nehemiah is saying is use me to help restore these people. I don't know how that's going to happen. 
Because I'm just the king's cupbearer. I don't even live in Jerusalem. I'm not even there in that city. Those people probably have no idea who I am. But grant it. Grant that the king would be nice to me. Grant it that the king would have a, be favorable to me. Give me success. The things that stir you, that God cares about, that God wants to do something about, maybe God wants to use you as an instrument of restoration. Maybe God wants to use you to fix or repair that which needs to be fixed. God, Nehemiah was willing to be used by God. That's the third thing. He was willing to be an instrument or a tool to repair that wall and to restore those people. I think Nehemiah was just mainly worried about the wall. And I think through God's power and strength, Nehemiah went to go build a wall. But I think God, through Nehemiah, began to restore a people. A cupbearer willing to be used by God to lead a broken people. He, he doesn't specifically say, God, would you send me there to build the wall? He just says, help me do something. And maybe that's where our prayers need to start, in the things that stir us and break us. Maybe instead of telling God what he should do, we should just maybe step back and say, God, use me to do whatever needs to be done. Be willing and ready to do something. Be willing and ready today to be used somehow. Have an open and ready mind to act on the things that God stirs within you. And maybe it'll work, and maybe it won't, but just allow God to use you somehow. Months go by. Months go by before Nehemiah ever gets an answer. And before Nehemiah is ever given any kind of nudge in which direction he should go. And we'll see more next week about what Nehemiah does. But know that, you know what? Nehemiah wasn't a leader. But God takes him and makes him one. God can give you whatever skills you need to be the answer to your own prayers. And to be the tool and the instrument that God needs us to be to serve in the capacity in which he's stirring in us. So from Nehemiah chapter 1, the biggest thing that, I'm, that I see God doing in Nehemiah and the challenge he presents to us is what stirs you. As you look at the city that you live in, what stirs you? As you look at the family you have, what stirs you? As you look at your own life, what bothers you? Let's not be afraid to ask that question, to lean into the things that stir our hearts, to ask God, what can I do to bring healing and restoration? What can I do to, to fix these things? What can I do to disciple somebody? What can I do to win my city for Christ, my family for Christ, my friends for Christ? For What, what can we do? Here's what I see. Here's who I know you to be, Lord. Use me. And maybe the thing that stirs us first is our own brokenness and sin. Maybe that's the thing that bothers us the most. We can't see past our own trouble and our own shame to even love on somebody else because right now, I'm the one that's in trouble. And I'm the one that's in shame. And God says... Then come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come and repent of your sins, and I will forgive you. He's gracious to forgive us of our sins every time we ask. So do that today. Come to him if you're weary, if you're burdened, if you're troubled, and he will give you rest. Come to him and confess and repent of the sin that maybe he's convicting you of right now. And we know that he is a gracious God who will forgive us of our sins. Lord God, we just thank you today for being a God who cares. For being a God who cares about where we are or even where we aren't. That even when the people of Israel were exiled to Babylon, you still cared. And that even when the people were building a temple but still not living for you, you still cared when they were living in a city with no walls and in disgrace and trouble, you still cared. God, you care about us. 
You care about the troubles we see. You care about the troubles we're carrying and the troubles in our own life. You care deeply about the sin, the unconfessed sin in our lives. And Spirit of God, right now, would you show us, would you stir in us something? Show us what we need to do somehow. But God, and most importantly, as we come to you in confession and repentance, God, forgive us today of the ways we've disobeyed, of the ways, God, that we have ignored the stirring that you've put in our hearts. God, help us today to begin to live in obedience and to serve you in whatever capacity you call us. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.